Welcome back to Operator Syndrome. I'm Patrick here with Steve, as always. Uh, we are talking about his first deployment as a United States Navy SEAL. Um, I believe we're in the Philippines, and we left off with a great teaser uh, talking about um, uh, a train-up for a potential operation that included your unit with working with some army rangers so we got to hear that tell us about that yeah so uh we were right in the middle of a coup d'etat uh which was a crazy little episode uh for for a couple reasons the, the, the guys we were training if you didn't see the previous issue we were training some filipino special forces and they uh were they had become default members of the opposition the, the rebel faction and so we were backing Corazon Aquino's loyalists, and we had to escort those guys off the base. And um, it was kind of awkward, <laughs> to put it mildly. So we'd just been training them, and then we find out. And they didn't even know. They hadn't even had it. They didn't even know a coup was going down, much less whose side they were on. So we said, may the force be with you. See you later. <laughs> and right after that, we uh, were tasked to... Um, okay, so... So... Uh, there were there were some of the army was against Aquino, some of her air force. I think the whole air force turned against her. And so um, the, the, the crazy thing about this is the timing. Timing is unbelievable. Right when this was going on, the, the United States was was vamping up in a, a full invasion of Panama, which is called Just Cause Operation Just Cause, where they went in a bunch of, you know, it was pretty quick and dirty because that's, I mean, we went in with all kinds of firepower and, um, and I had mentioned some seals got killed in that, that operation. That was one of our, our first large losses. Um, guys got stuck on an airfield and it was Rangers that got them out of there. Cause it was, they should have never been a platoon size for seals. It, it should have been like a, more like almost two or three pl platoons of Rangers to take that airfield. But anyway, so that was going on and, we didn't even know it till like i think it overlapped uh it was really close because we were we were getting calls from buddies back home saying man team four and team two are down and they're going in and blowing stuff up in panama so, so this is 89 then 89 right. 89 was the year <laughs> and so we were tasked to do a mission my platoon and our sister platoon uh we had two different missions and this would normally have been national assets doing these but right, they were right. going into panama i mean right. they were going after noriega so national assets tier one um we've talked about the army side and the navy side and um and that was more of the focus right then than helping aquino but we were behind her too and so we got tasked with a mission two two missions that that would have if, if the scenario had been any more any normal scenario I'm sure it would have been um, tier one guys coming to do it, but they didn't, they were doing something else. So, and this is before the big, I mean, now they've, there's so many troops and units, gosh, they've, they've become this amazing, right. huge force now, right. but this is back in 89. I mean, we were still figuring stuff out back then, much less, mm -hmm. you know, we didn't have all 20 years of combat experience like we do now. So anyway, so what was going on? President Bush, uh, we would hear it from him. I mean, we would hear it through through the chain of command from the president. Um, he he basically launched a bunch of fighters. By the way, in the last episode, I think I said uh, an aircraft carrier in the Subic Bay. I meant Manila Bay uh, near Manila. That was just I was brain fart. And uh, so they launched a bunch of fi not a bunch. It was like four or five F-18s, I think. Uh, and they grounded the entire Filipino Air Force with just a few fighters to tell you how, I mean, the kind of firepower we have, one aircraft carrier battle group, most people don't realize that's more than most countries have. <laughs> um, right. One group, and we have like seven or groups, you know, it's just crazy. Anyway, uh, so the Air Force couldn't fly. They couldn't take off. So that cripples them. And then we were tasked with, so Corazon Aquino, the president, uh, was in her presidential palace and she was surrounded by one of their rebel factions and they were trying they were threatening to i guess kill her or capture her or i don't know something but she had sufficient 
um, security to keep them at bay. So, so my so kind of like a siege, right? Basically a siege, yeah. and and it it was going to be god awful. I'm glad it didn't have to go to where it was going to go. Bruce's platoon, my sniper buddy, who was in a sister platoon, was tasked with fast roping into the presidential palace and extracting Corazon Aquino and bringing her to safety on an American base. They had, they were working with Rangers. They had, it was like at least, it was at least two platoons of Rangers because they were going to go full on in and encircle the people that encircled Aquino. Nice. And we, they had, I, it was crazy because they had like an AC-130 gunship, which if you have never seen one of those in action, it's something to see. It's like the 4th of July. And they were going to mow down like sections of the whole neighborhood to protect her. It, it didn't happen. We it, The force turned rather quickly. And like overnight, the loyalists had the upper hand and we were all back in them. And it was like, you know... <laughs> This is not going to end well if you want to fight us. Um, mm -hmm. So Bruce's platoon was going to go in, get her, and uh, bring her to a base. And then there were some really high level, I don't know if they were official government people, but I know there were some CEOs, some very important people, American businessmen in the Intercontinental Hotel in downtown Manila. It was like, I don't know how high this thing was. We, I mean, we had all the data back then. It was like, a skyscraper i mean this thing okay. was huge and um and uh the 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 filipino rangers who were were one of the rebel forces and they had surrounded and taken the lobby of this hotel we didn't have any data on how uh or, or intel on had they gone up into the floors uh, the best we knew they were just holding the lobby but they weren't letting anybody go out and these americans had planes to catch they had you know, and I, I don't know how it, well it all works, but but the president said, go in and, and secure that place and get those guys out of there. And uh, so that was our mission. But we're talking. Oh, I'm so glad we didn't have to do it because it was um, a platoon of seals us. That was back in that day. It was 14 of us, which not that many for a big hotel like that. So they augmented us with with more Rangers. And we had, uh, they had built a mock-up of the, of the roof. Uh, and and okay. the, the operation was going to be Rangers, I think kind of Black Hawk Down style. We're going to, we're going to fly in and fast rope into, into around the block of the Intercontinental Hotel. And there was a lot of them. I think there was maybe two or three platoons of Rangers. They're going to go in there and for, form a, what's called a cordon force like block off that whole area this way and that way. So there was no getting in or out right. uh, with those guys on the ground. And then we had another uh, group of Rangers with us who were practicing with us, fast roping with us. We were, they were on a different bird, but we were, we were doing, we were fast roping on the same place, which would have been the rooftop of the intercontinental hotel and taking up security positions, forming a perimeter, all this and um, they were helping us with breaching. Uh, we had myself and uh, one other guy were going to breach as well as shoot assault. It, you kind of do it both when you, you get in. Um, but we were we were loaded because we didn't know how many doors we might have to go through. I mean, can right. imagine? It, I mean, it would it was just going to be crazy. And I think you know, in the at the very end, uh, you know, blades were almost turning on the helos, if I remember correctly. And we were getting ready. We are suited up, ready to go, locked and loaded. And it, it, it was called off like minutes, but half hour, an hour before we were going to head out. Do you, so that was do you cool. know why they called it off? No, I think, I think, I think if I remember correctly, the Rangers, the Filipinos re just retreated out of there they got word i don't know what happened but they were just like we can't hold this place and and they they were needed somewhere else and things mm -hmm. were just going downhill quickly for them and god knows who else was fighting out there i mean i i just knew these two select ops where it was kind of high high value towards sorts of missions and and it was us and rangers and but it was we really worked well with the rangers i mean we 
I, I don't know. We just jived and um, we, we sure as, sure as hell wanted more guns. <laughs> and uh, well, a situation like that, I mean, when you know you're about to go into a, um, you know, a tough situation, um, kind of all the, the bravado, you know, slips away and it's like, okay, we're about to do this. Let's, let's no figure doubt. this out. Let's work together. I imagine a lot of the, the train up or, or the thinking beforehand must have been, you said it, there got to be a million rooms. <laughs> there got to be a million <sighs> rooms in this thing. You no can't doubt. care. I mean, uh, I, I guess it was a lot of like brushing up on, on manual breaching. I mean, yeah. manual shotguns, yeah. all that type of stuff shotguns I mean, we had could, yeah. could you even carry enough i mean a skyscraper no. can you even carry enough shotgun rounds to blow so you got no. it has to be manual first right yeah absolutely yeah. Yeah. And, and we were just hoping we had the room numbers and i guess they had communicated the intel network with these people okay good guys are coming let them in <laughs> they got you mm -hmm. um and we had some sort of bona fide figured out you know so they they would know it was us i mean it, filipinos they, they couldn't even speak english so it wouldn't have been that hard, but yeah, we, we had the rooms, but it was going to be, if I remember correctly, we, we weren't going to kick every door, but we were going to get to the high value people who needed out of there. And mm -hmm. it probably was state department people, or I think it was, they didn't tell us who it was, but right. I think it was high, high level people who had, had a priority to get out of there safely. And um, so we were just going to, and I think remember correctly, we were just going to us and the Rangers were going to secure like, each end of the hallway on every floor. We had enough guys to, to do that. Well, we didn't quite have enough guys to do that, but we had enough guys to do the floors that the, the targets were on. Mm -hmm. And of course we'd have security up the stairwell on both sides and down the stairwell. So you're going to be in a shit storm. If you try to come up in our area where we're, you know, getting to those floors where we got to get these people, but it, all that being said, it, it gave me such a headache to think what, what, how wrong it could go. You're talking about winds. We're talking about we were using 90 foot fast ropes, which is if you if you ever had that joy, that's a long fast rope. And your hands are smoking literally when you get to the bottom of that thing. No doubt. And um, because there were other impediments, we had to use the long ones. And you know, it doesn't take much. Clarification: a 90 yeah. foot, a 90 foot rope onto a skyscraper that's oh, yeah. however many however yeah. many stories tall. Stories tall, and you know. Helicopters aren't perfectly still. Sometimes they yip, yip and yap and flap and forth, back and forth. But uh, and especially if they're getting shot at, I mean, it's like, uh, you know, it just had potential bad things written all over it. I'd but, be more I'd be more afraid of that rope than I would yeah. be clearing the structure. Honest to goodness, yeah. I was most most worried about that because we had to get a lot of guys on that roof. I mean, <laughs> I mean. God, I don't know. It would have been about 30 guys. So in multiple helos coming in. So, there. so because of the, um, because of what was going on in Panama at the time, uh, if not action over there at the same time, then probably a buildup of some sort. Um, did you have one sixtieth for this? Who was your, who is going to, no. who are going to be your, your drivers? No, we didn't have first Sal or one sixty we had just regular helo pilots oh wow so i would have been definitely afraid yeah of that right yeah it was just yeah well, i think it was navy pilots <laughs> i mean regular navy pilots that are flying off aircraft carriers it was like this has just got i don't i didn't want to you know and, and here's the thing you don't want to cast bad juju on something right you want to be all positive 100 committed there's a whole psychology to this that soldiers know you don't want to start saying I think this is this is a cursed op or something like that because then it gets in everybody's heads. I mean, just weird psychodynamics happen. Mm -hmm. So, but but I was thinking to myself, and Bruce, he's the one guy. I mean, we really he. It was funny because we would always we kind of look at each other and go, mm. and we wouldn't. It's, we, I could read his mind, and I think he could read my mind, and, and we just had this rapport of like, oh, gosh, what are we doing? But. We didn't have to do it by God's grace. And um, Aquino was successful. And, you know, that was the end of that. So I don't, I don't know if any shots were fired between Americans and Filipinos, but we didn't fire any. And the, the tide was turned. Do, as far as you can remember, did, <clears throat> did that action, 
I mean, you didn't you didn't participate in Panama, so presumably, no. presumably either what was going on in the in the Philippines or in Southeast Asia was enough to keep you all there. They they had already assigned you know whatever the assets were going to be for the Panama invasion. Right. What was <clears throat> so? What was that? Do you remember the feeling in in the unit whenever Panama turned out to be a big deal? Right, turned out to be the real deal, and and you yeah. all and you all were kind of, you yeah. all kind of had your shot at something, but it didn't pan out. And now yeah. you know across the Pacific, something's going down, and and folks are getting into it. Well, do you remember what that mood was like? Yeah, I do. I do. Um, we were um, a little bit jealous, to be honest. You know, and you were the top. Uh, if correct me if I'm wrong, you were a top. We're, wait no desert storm you were the top platoon at yeah. this time were, were were you one of those still a top platoon at that time we were a very average platoon at that time okay right. we, i wouldn't say we were exceptional but we weren't we weren't at the low end of the spectrum we were very average for a okay. steel platoon so we were we were capable um yeah for those maybe civilian listeners or if you you know you train all your life to do the real deal it's kind of like being trained to be a surgeon and never getting to operate on, on somebody. I mean, you've dedicated your life to this. You put in long, hard hours of sweat and blood and tears and um, you want to work, you, you know, you're the motivation I had. And I mean, I still have as a Patriot for, for this country is just that I will do anything for my country. I, I'll, 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 I'll die. And, and more, more than that even is for your brothers, you know? So guys next to you you know that's what keeps such cohesion in in some really nasty situations but it was kind of disappointing because we knew well this is big and 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 knew we started to get intel uh through the intelligence networks of what was going on in in panama um i don't know how much was coming out in the media back then it was kind of a different age of media but we were we were like wow dev groups going in and and, and cags going in there and um those guys were going after Noriega. I mean, and he, we didn't know, I don't think they knew where he was. They got him. I don't know who got him. <laughs> you should go back and read that story. But um, Rangers, a lot of SEAL, regular SEAL teams. So it was East Coast guys going in there. Uh, two, I know four and team two. So it was kind of like, ah, well, we almost got a shot here in a PI to do something cool. But that didn't work out. Um, damn, those guys are down there doing the deed. And it was a major operation operation right. just cause yeah and and they they got noriega and and i was in panama teaching a course just uh <laughs> well, uh, it was about it was before the covid lockdown i i flew down there from the university of louisville we had a partner school in in panama panama city uh, uh in panama and um these kids are like uh college age kids and and they're they're very smart it was an exclusive school so they came from well-to-do families in fact the president of, of panama's son went there so i was like i better be on my best behavior but anyhow it the kids were really sharp but they said i said you know you know it's funny is i knew guys who were in the just cause invasion to overthrow the dictator and like wow we study about that in the history books and yeah i'm like oh that makes me feel great <laughs> but <laughs> But no, we, we got a big yuck out of it. But on the other hand, I have to say, looking back now, but, but even looking back then, when we got back home, back stateside after our deployment to the Philippines, man, they, there were f at least four guys killed on that airfield. Um, and, and some guys were seriously hurt. One guy, a, a, a guy who I visited and, and visited with his parents in the hospital was paralyzed from the waist down really cool guy and um i don't even remember his name but i i i he, i didn't i didn't go through buds with him but i i went to balboa i heard one of the four guys is at balboa doing balboa is the naval medical center on the on the west coast kind of like bethesda walter reed on the east and um he, he was doing some rehab and i said man i gotta go see this guy and i was just so sad to see a guy who's so much talent so young and he's never going to walk again and took a round right through his spinal cord. I, lucky yeah. to live. So looking back on that, I'm like, damn, I don't, maybe I would have been the one to get, take a bullet. So mm -hmm. kind of one of those things you look over your shoulder and go, man, I'm kind of glad I'm not, I wasn't there. Um, and, you know, 
in a kind of little, little bit of a tangent, you know, I, I will talk about this at some point. I got orders to green team at Dev Group uh, right at the time where my enlistment was up. And I decided I want to go a different direction in life, go to college, other things. Um, and so I turned down Dev Group. And that, that's always been something that I'm kind of like, has always been torn about. I don't even know if I could have made it through green team, but I, had, I was selected for it and um, I had a shot. But then again, one of my best friends, Brad O'Neill, who I mentioned previously, he, uh, you know, he went to Dev Group and and went made it through Green Team and was an operator and was killed in in two thousand. So, I don't know. It's really a. It's really a. I don't. Even, I don't know if you can kind of articulate it, Patrick. But it, it's kind of a weird, ambiguous thing. It's like I want to live. I don't want to die. I, I'm willing to die for my country, but I don't want to die, <laughs> you know, right. it's just a crazy thing. And, and that sets up all kinds of weird guilt when, you know, <laughs> for people who, yeah. who survive and they're, they're, they know a really good dude that, that didn't. So anyway. Well, yeah, I mean, I, I can definitely identify and we'll, and we'll definitely talk about, you know, my own experiences in, in more depth, but, but that feeling of, it is such a strange feeling wanting to do being terrified of of something a mission we'll say being terrified mm -hmm. of a mission not wanting to go but at the same time wanting to go equally as bad yeah. you know it, it it it's such a strange feeling and it's such it, it plays it, it erects such havoc on your mind to to be terrified of something but yet want to do it at the same time um you know you know in warfare they've like they've honed it perfectly you know and you were saying it like wanting to be there for your teammates to be there for your unit you know that's why you want to go um you don't want to go because you want you you don't want to get hurt and right. and for most people hopefully you don't really want to hurt somebody right yeah. like if they're going to do bad things then you're you're more than willing to do bad things to yeah. them right yeah. so which yeah. is there's a nuance there yeah. um because because if you just want to go out and hurt people you know you're yeah. a psychopath you're yeah. you know and th and that's the nuance that that some people don't understand um that's right you know, there there is there is a line there um but then at the same time being terrified and then wanting to go and then and then if it and if a mission doesn't go off you know let's talk about you know so that that hotel takedown doesn't go down you know then then you're like well shit now we we didn't do it god i wanted to do that but yeah. thank, but you know what thank god i'm alive I'm yeah gonna i'm gonna live today yeah. because we didn't do that i mean those that's a the the emotional roller coaster um is intense it's so intense yeah so intense um you know one thing you'd mentioned to me we're going to talk about you know continuing on this theme about you know sort of the mental game and uh, the, the operator syndrome, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, yeah. That comes with the lifestyle. You know, we were talking, you, you had mentioned to me off air um, yeah. how, how on, that, on that hotel takedown mission, um, somebody, somebody wasn't in the right headspace, you mm -hmm. know, not necessarily through any fault of their own, but right. that, ended up, that ended up having some, some bad consequences for, for yeah. him. Can you talk about that? Yeah, yeah, happy to. I'm, we're never, unless it's, unless we're praising somebody, we're never going to mention any names because yeah. I have such respect for all these guys. There's no yep. judgment. And, and even when we have to say things that are, that may sound critical, there's no judgment attached to that for the person. Like I say, if, if I were in some of the situations of the people I may be sounding like I'm being critical of, I could have done the same thing. And I, there's absolutely, um, yeah. So just, as a disclaimer, you know, um, we could all do this like at any moment. Um, so there were, so we were practicing this long fast rope. I mean, God awful fast rope in a very dangerous situation on top of a skyscraper. And we had to have tons of gear. Um, we had a breaching, we had bolt cutters. We had, you know, you name it ammo. I mean, the, the list goes on and we were trying to cut out anything that was not absolutely like every ounce. So yeah, no rations, no, we were taking only mission essential gear 
it would be nice to have a whole wagon load of stuff right. <laughs> when you're going, but it's not possible because you, you we're going down each individual is going down this fast rope, which is a, for, I guess we should say this for, I, we always assume people know what these are. It's a big thick rope. It's about that big around and you wear these welders gloves and you, you, you basically slide down it like a fireman's pole with all your gear. And it's, when you get to the bottom, if you have a lot of gear on, your hands are literally smoke is coming off of them. I mean, they're smoking. Right. If, it's long, smell, if it's long enough. Definitely. If it's long enough. Yeah. Yeah. A, a low one. Not, not really. You're just on the ground in a few seconds, right, but right. a long one. And we use long ones because we had to do something called visit board search and seizure. Visit or vertical board search and seizure or visit board search and seizure. I can't remember what it's VBSS. And it was us fast roping onto ships for piracy issues and taking over a ship. And we're flying in a helo over over a ship that's moving right and landing on hopefully the helo pad on the ship but man i saw things go completely sideways a bunch but we were again using very long fast ropes because you got to clear the rigging on the on the ship so it's it's a long descent mm -hmm. and there are many times on those long 90 footers you can smell the smoke of the guy below you coming off the rope it's literally smoking and your hands are I remember kicking those gloves off and be like, ow, ow, ooh, ooh, ow. Oh, yeah. It was really hot. Anyway, so. Did you, uh, did you double glove? Were you a double glove? Oh, yeah. Glover? We double. Yeah, we double gloved it. All right. And that leads to another problem. You can't get as much tension yeah, on it when right. you double glove it. It's There's all these things that you never would think of in a million years. Um, so back to the story. So we decided to take to absolutely everything that wasn't essential. I mean how do you how do you even get into that so we decided in this in not to wear plates ceramic plate body armor we were wearing our soft body armor but not there's there's two layers of body armor and and you and if you really are you know back and, and the body armor has come a million light years right. since then but right. we would have a kevlar soft body armor wrap and it would have pouches where we could put ceramic plates which would stop an assault rifle round, a, a high velocity round. You couldn't only take, you couldn't take too many of those, but you, you know, one or two, it would stop them. We, we just couldn't, those plates are heavy and you got them front and back. And we said, no plates, we, we just can't afford it. And if we just got to shoot better than they do, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. we, we wore our soft body armor, but, and so just because we had to reduce every ounce on that rope. Well, one of the guys, had just had a little baby girl and um, he hadn't even seen her yet. You know, he, he she, his wife had given birth when we were deployed and um, he had pictures of her and he was just, he was scared. Uh, he was scared of never seeing his daughter or his wife again. And um, I always tell young guys going in, if you want to go this route, you know, I, I don't know if I would recommend getting married. Um, it's just, it, it's stuff that can get in your head and you if you want to be the best and you want to be focused on the highest level missions why do you need it you've got all the rest of your life to do it and why put her through that because that's a hell of a lot to put a wife through not knowing cra crazy stress every day it's just something to think about i'm not judging anybody that uh, plenty of good guys right. that do it and pull it off but um i also saw about 75 percent of marriages not work but that's just another thing. But so he was so worried. He, he used his plates and he put his plates in and he was so loaded down. We, we were all so loaded down. And this was in a rehearsal. This is not the we didn't do the real the real op. Mm -hmm. um, and we rehearsed it. God, I don't remember multiple times that fast rope was the one we rehearsed the most because that was going to be the hardest. And he came down smoking down. He was not a light guy to begin with. I mean, <laughs> he was a big guy. And he then loaded down and then with his plates and he came so fast down that rope, he, he just crushed his ankle. It's a wonder he didn't completely like permanently disable his leg. I mean, he, he, I don't know if it was broken, but it, he was going home. I mean, he went stateside because he was a casualty and it was like, man, you know, it's one thing to do that on a training operation and it's bad enough. But, you know, you start having guys go down, it's like Black Hawk down. And, and, and that's not necessarily anybody's fault. But once you have it, it compounds the issues. When you have one guy go down, you need every shooter to be ready to go. And you start having casualties. Now you got to pull people away from 
doing assaulting or whatever to try to deal with your casualties. So it was, it was pretty reckless, but not, I'm not blaming that. I'm just saying that's, that's, that's an issue where family and headspace can really put your more than anything, you put your brothers in harm's way. Right. I, um, I had um, a couple of thoughts. I had um, <clears throat> overseas, one of my, I, we were in Iraq, one of them. We, we had an individual who, um, uh, in our battalion, who, um, who had, a, had a mishap while on, while on a bird, while on a, while on a helicopter assault. Um, and they believed that some stuff back home um, mm. contributed to, to some, some, some mistakes, we'll say. Um, or, or some actions that he probably wouldn't have taken normally. And there were a lot of that. And as with most things, there are, it's, there are a lot of things that go wrong altogether that, yeah. that end up in someone getting hurt, but he ended up, ended up dying. Um, and, um, and, and then not long after, uh, I had a situation with some stuff going on back home and my platoon leadership pulled me from a mission just because. Wow because of what happened so mm -hmm. um they said uh, hey you're not going out tonight um you know they they had heard they had got wind of what what had happened and then back home and then they said hey you're not going out tonight um and that was tough and it was tough for me to sit back behind and for the rest of the platoon you know they'd be like hey nelson what's up like mm -hmm. aren't you getting kitted up like aren't you going out and i'm like no nah, i'm not going out tonight and it just felt like a huge piece of shit for not yeah, going yeah. out but yeah. but but look now looking back i can appreciate you know them them having that concern and looking out for me protecting yeah. me from myself you know another thing i was thinking of <clears throat> we're coming up on close here actually but yeah. um another thing i was thinking about is back then 89 so 89 plates of any kind would have been kind of more high speed because i think yeah. sort of generally they were the 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 conventional military was probably still wearing it's like that it's kind of like soft armor but like the flak vests yeah like the old school sort of flak vest not vietnam style but right kind of flak vest so the idea of dropping the ceramic plates probably wasn't my guess is probably wasn't that crazy of an idea because most of the military oh. didn't even have ceramic plates right right, right. Yeah. yeah yeah and yeah 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 those plates were yeah first generation stuff mm -hmm. um and, and, they, and those were probably really significantly heavy and they were really heavy they were god awful heavy i they were like several pounds each you know mm -hmm. front and back so it was yeah yeah so if anyone's listening and you're comparing it to what you wore yeah you know in in 2010 you, yeah. you're you're probably off by a few pounds yeah. each yeah. On, and the on thickness each. of those things i mean the <laughs> thickness of those things was ridiculous although i do feel like the seals look for any excuse to drop plates it's yeah. like <laughs> It's like, hey, it's above 100 degrees. We got to drop plates. Yeah. Hey, yeah. we're like, what? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we don't need to take the soft armor even. <laughs> Let's go. Yeah, yeah. Seriously. Um, uh, okay. Well, I don't know. I, we'll have to save it. We're going to have to save your, your, your lockout story for the next one. So, um, uh, but I think in the next episode, I'm going to talk a little bit about my, my first train up uh, or lack thereof. And then my first deployment. And then we'll just keep bouncing back and forth. So, uh, thanks everyone for listening and we'll catch you in the next one.